blessing to provide for us each day. Sometimes we take for granted that we're aware of every good gift comes from you. Father, we ask your blessing on this class this morning as we open our Bibles and study. We're thankful for our teacher, Brother Tim, and his ability to lead us and teach us more about what you want us to live our lives. And Father, we're thankful for this church and each and every member of the congregation here. Folks to serve in special ways, our deacons and elders, and all of our teachers especially. And Father, we're, our hearts are with us this morning with folks that are dealing with the COVID-19. We ask your blessings on them and they'll soon be able to be back with us and resume their place here with us. And Father, we're thankful for this country we live in. Things don't always go the way we want, but we are still grateful that we are blessed and we are reaping the benefits of those that come on way before us. Father, if we ask your blessings on the ones who was mentioned this morning in our class that need, uh, uh, need our, our, our help and their help as well. Father, go with us through this, through this class and through the rest of this day. Forgive us when we sin, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Still got warm. You want it? <laughs> My wife, the little iceberg, is uh, over here. It was funny. Someone said something Wednesday night about uh, the temperature. I had sweat running down the back of my back when I decided to take my jacket off. I said, okay, this is ridiculous. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I didn't turn on any fans or hit the temperature. I just took care of my own. But anyway, we can't please everyone. That's just part of life on any topic. That's why we have varieties of restaurants and uh, different clothes to wear and, 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 and. So, somebody, somebody once said, if you, if you know the secret to success, then you the secret to failure. And I was trying to plead everybody. Well, there you go. All right, let me take just a, a little minute to, uh, to look ahead. Now, I know that uh, you feel like we have been in 1 Corinthians forever. It isn't actually forever. It's just been as long as Paul was preaching. It took us longer to, to study it than it did for him to make his missionary journeys. But nonetheless, we are nearly through chapter with 1 Corinthians. Uh, we have, this is the, the last issue collection, really is the last topic. And uh, the next thing Paul does is say goodbye, and I'm coming to see you, and that's it. So, I mean, we'll just we'll go through that in, in no time at all. And... Um, and don't get your hopes up. It didn't happen in today. Uh, I don't want you to think that we're going to wrap it up this morning. But the uh, my intent after we finish up the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is to take a uh, um, a discussion of the, the great book of the New Testament of conversions, the book of Acts. And uh, it is it is not a difficult study and is one of the most rewarding pieces of literature in Scripture. Um, it is truly amazing. Uh, that's my intent. I think we'll be there in the book of Acts by uh, December. And if you know what today's date is, that means we're, we're going to move. Now, this morning, having said all of that, uh, I probably have one phrase in, in verse 2 that we're going to talk about the whole morning. Because there's some practical stuff related to where we are that I need to flesh out and uh, discuss. Some questions from last week, some applications that we need to do. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. That there be no collections when I come. Paul was very interested that when he arrived to take the contribution being given by the Corinthians back to the church in Jerusalem, that there would be no delay in getting this together. So get it ahead of time uh, taken care of. If we went and looked at Paul's second book, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, we would find that is the topic of conversation. Paul is now really ready. We, we think this is coming soon. Clearly it's not coming as soon as we might think. We don't know the gap between 
1 and 2 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul says, now I'm coming. I'm bringing the Macedonians with me. I bragged about you guys a year ago being ready uh, with your contribution, and uh, now, you know, make sure it's ready to go. So a period of time passes here um, as Paul is getting ready to, to do this. Now, last week... Um, had a conversation and a question came up about the the concept of laying by in store on the first day of the week. Um, and a modern question, today if you go into the foyer you're going to encounter the basket. Uh, in Jesus' day it says that Jesus sat and watched as the people cast money into the treasury. This was something that was done in the time of the Lord. Um, our methodology has tended to be, until this year, that you sit in the pew and collection trays are passed by you. Right? You've been anywhere where something other than that was done? At one of our churches? I haven't. Well, you have now. We got a basket in a foyer. And you can put into it when you go into the auditorium, when you come out of the auditorium, or some people hunt it at other times. I will say it's important to do it as you come in, because if you're dispensing with your cups on your way out, yeah, you know, I've had to pick my contribution <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least twice. <laughs> carry away. Good tip there. <laughs> I was thinking that, uh, <laughs> you know, you might have the folks who put their contribution in on the way in, didn't like the sermon, and want it back. <laughs> so you might want to wait till after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or what was the guy uh, who does all the redneck, you might be a redneck, said, have you ever made a uh, change in the offering plate? It's very easy to do that now. You might be a redneck. It's very hard to do. Well, I don't know. If you see somebody over there pawing through the basket, you know. That'd be me. Anyway. <laughs> um, so anyway, we've got a, we've got a different methodology. And um, would it be okay if we had a, a card reader up there on the table next to the... To the basket. Yeah, I'm swipe and go, yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe a whole bank of them where you could walk up, you know, and chip your card and, and uh, make your contribution. Would that be okay? It will eventually be that way. It already is that way in a lot of places. <laughs> Actually, I don't have my phone with me because I don't touch my phone on Sunday as a rule. Sometimes I do. Uh, any of you have an app where you can pay things on your app, on your phone? Yeah. Yeah. C did you know that you can make churches the? Uh, well, we got to get Anthony on that. The receptor for PayPal. Do it. All you got to do is just make them the person that you pay to. They set up an account. You get when you get ready, you go hit pay the amount now. Done. Is that okay? So I'm asking, is that okay? It's a cultural thing. It's not, you're still it's giving. It's a matter of currency. If Anthony sits up there and has a little card reader, we just swap it on the card reader and like the square. Yeah. That'd be all right. Okay. So we're in agreement. Nobody thinks that would be inappropriate? In a matter of time, that's going to be the way it's going to be. I suspect you're right. It, it's going to be, it is that way. Nobody knows. No money, no check. Because I keep up with a lot of, you know, read a lot of stuff related to churches of all kinds, religious groups. Um, this is the, the new normal for lots of groups. They talk about the different uh, pay platforms and which one's better for churches, which one's better for people, most secure, least cost. There is a little cost in administration from some of these, so that becomes an issue. All right, uh, next step. Yeah. I, I got, I got a question. I mean, what about from uh, teaching your kids standpoint? I mean, I know that's a, that's a low hanging fruit. That's something we're responsible for, but it's also something that's very important. Oh no, I don't know. I think it's extremely important. You know, our children grow up watching us and learning from what we do. And if you've ever raised a little one, you probably stuck a coin or two in their hands so that when the contribution plate came by, they could put something in, or maybe a dollar. 
Uh, you also have probably had the experience of trying to pry it loose. You know, when it comes and they, you know, they don't want to, or they want to, they want to slow it down, or so because it goes, it's too fast. A handful of coins, and you go, clink, 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 and let them go. Uh, yeah, I've seen that too. Uh, that's a that's a good good observation. How do we teach our children about giving? They watch you give. Um, maybe they don't. If you're if you do a check, but they still watch you put something in the collection plate. But now we're not doing the collection plate. So are you going to take them back to the basket and show them that you're doing that? That's a that's a good thought. I um, have a collection question. Okay. It's not about a plate per se, but I have a question whenever it's convenient. Okay. Well, let me get to the next one, and then I'll kick that one out. All right. So we've got, we've decided we swipe our card. Can I set it up for an automatic debit? Can I just set up my account so that every week a certain amount Automatic is deducted pay. from this account into that account? Am I giving? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, you're purposing in your heart already. I am purposing you're, in my you're, heart. You're, you're putting this first, and I'm going to do this for sure. Okay, but my transaction says that it can't be processed until Monday. Well, they don't deposit the check until two weeks later. Yeah. Two. It's, it's usually so you don't know that it's not on the first day of the week. You did give it on the first day of the week. You can't. But it's posted that day. But they don't get the check on the Sunday. If it's auto drafted, I don't give it on any first day of the week. I may have set it up on Thursday, and I may never touch but it again. But it's purposed in your heart. I mean, there's no way that you're not going to give if it's done like that. Because if you're out of town, it's still good. If you set it up to post on every Sunday, you are given on the first day of the week, just like you would if you put that check in the basket, because that check's not going to post on Sunday. It's going to post on Tuesday or Thursday or three weeks later, whenever Charles makes it to the bank. Would it be so, wrong for me to set it up to post every Tuesday? Yes. <laughs> but I thought it was going to post on the first day. They won't, but, but you can schedule it for the yeah. You can schedule so that it again, that way. not. They did not. Question for you. Jesus raised an issue and he said is man made for the Sabbath or is Sabbath made for man? What drives what? The dog wag the tail? Tail wag the dog. If we're talking about the first day of the week. Why did Paul instruct the church to do this on the first day of the week. I think it's sort of a conversation with it all together. Because that's when they would be gathered together. So while you're gathered together, when you come together to take the Lord's Supper, when you come together to worship, when you gather with the church, that's when you give. Alright? Now, if in order to understand things, it's it's necessary that we don't lose purpose. Uh, unnecessarily. Now sometimes there is a reason why certain things must be the way they are and that's not adjustable. Other times they're not they don't have to be a particular way. There, There's a more general way that things can be done without it being a violation of scripture. And it can be a challenge to determine which is which. Is it a pattern for which there is specific authority that we must follow or is it a concept that gives us a certain amount of freedom and latitude? Let me illustrate that. Let's take Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, 21. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. That's what Jesus said. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all the things that I commanded you, and lo and with you always, even to the end of the world. All right, Mark 16. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes that is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. What is the purpose of that instruction? All right, we have Jesus mentioning authority. Okay, that's the issue. All authority is 
give it unto me. All right, what does he tell them to do? You help me with the list. What does Jesus tell them to do? Go. Go. Let's break it down into pieces. Go do what? In all the world. Teach. Baptize. All the world. What? Baptize. Baptize. Okay. Anything else? I did these as y'all were talking about them. Okay, so teaching. Let's let's break those. That works into a, a category, doesn't it? Not the best bracket I ever made. Let's try that again. Okay, how do these work together? What is the practice? What is the process of making disciples? How do we make disciples? Okay, we're going to preach the gospel to them. All right. 1 Corinthians one twenty one, Paul says, God chose through preaching to save those who believe. All right, so the process of preaching is how we're going to make disciples. Now, the making disciples part and the teaching part actually are separated by time. In uh, Matthew nineteen or Matthew twenty eight, Jesus says, "Go make disciples of all the nations." teaching them all the things that I've commanded you. So the making disciples is going to involve some of the teaching, but there's more teaching than just making them disciples. There's teaching afterwards. So we're going to have teaching part A and teaching part B. A, we might describe more as preaching. It is the message of the gospel that causes them to become converted. Part B is what follows up. Which part are we doing in here right now? What are we doing? We're doing that right there. We are following the Great Commission right now, this minute, in this classroom. We are doing what Jesus said to do. We are disciples, but there's still a need for us to be taught things relative to what Jesus wanted us to know about all of our aspects of our work. So we are continuing the Great Commission right here. Sometimes we think about the Great Commission only in the terms of, of the original, make the disciples. But there's also the continuation of that process. The Great Commission is not a one-time-and-done deal. It's a lifetime change and commitment that we do. Okay? So. Well, then preaching goes up there then first before teaching. It does. Yes. Yeah. What's the difference in preaching and teaching? Well, you're telling somebody about something. Once they get baptized, and you start teaching them. What's the difference in preaching and teaching? I mean, we cut a couple of letters. PR versus T. Uh, what is the difference in preaching and teaching? I think maybe we would we would have a category. We would recognize a distinction that may not be. Um, as great a distinction as we might think. Typically, you would say that in a few minutes when I'm up in the front, you would call that preaching, not teaching. Here, you would call this teaching, not preaching. Correct? I'm not trying to push anything on you. Would you, most of us say that that's, that's correct? Is the difference the, the methodology? Is it content? Is it, you know, who does it? How it's done? Classroom setting versus a you know, a, a public speaker, that kind of thing. Part of it's English, you know, it's the concept of preaching and teaching. It. Do what? Some people listening to it. Well, aren't you listening now? I am, but you're teaching now. Okay. Those, that's, those that are in the audience. Oh, out there, they won't be listening? Is that your point? <laughs> Half will be asleep. Well, that's <laughs> the other part. <clears throat> the parables, Jesus uh, doing the parables be more in line with preaching? I know that we can say, okay, 
This is preaching. This is teaching. We, we recognize the difference, but there's also an overlap. And maybe the overlap needs to be bigger than this. I don't know. Uh, we'd be able to say, okay, this is one thing. This, this, is, this doesn't involve preaching. That doesn't involve teaching, but somewhere in there, you get both. Right? Isn't that how you, I mean, you may not like my circles, but wouldn't you agree that we've got an, something that's not the same and something that is the same and they overlap at some level? So, you know, let's not get too cuckoo here and, and mess up with preaching and teaching. Um, God chose preaching to save the world, but that's a translation of crego, which to, to proclaim. So, you know, when we... We could take 1 Corinthians one twenty one, and we could make God chose to save the world through teaching. It's not just a one person's got to be Paul out, you know, on the stump. It's a passing of information. That's what the, the goal of Christianity is in terms of making converts. All right, so we're going to make the disciples. How are we going to make the disciples? I think it's very important and interesting that Jesus included this in the making of the disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because even today, that is still one of the brutal debates in religious discussion. I was reading from a guy, I won't name him. Um, he is a, a denominational guy, he's Calvinist. I, I will really like some of the stuff he writes. He's a um, always challenges me with his thoughts. He's wrong on some stuff. They're just, just plain wrong. He's Calvinist. He accepts certain things that simply are not true. They're in harmony with the, the Calvinist line. But anyway, I'm, so I'm reading this article, and uh, he's got... Uh, if I use that word, that's so loaded and negative. I was going to say hypocritical. That's, that's not the word I want to use. I want to say he, has, he is holding to um, ideas. There's a word in my mind I'm not can't quite get it yet. It is, hang on a second. I didn't take my medicine today. Um, it's not incongruent, although it is incongruent. It's not the word. Well, it'll come back to me in a second. There, there is a, there's a specific word that describes a person who holds beliefs that are in conflict with each other. Thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to get. Could not get there. I had a cognitive block. Cognitive dissonance. Actually, I introduced that word to Lonnie, and he said, what? I said, we had a good conversation about it. It means that you hold on to more than one idea in your head that are incompatible, that they cannot exist together, and yet we hold them together. I hate banana popsicles. Give me a banana popsicle. No, it, you know, that, that doesn't work. You, know, you you got to have one or the other, but you can't have both. All right, so his, his view, he's arguing the importance of baptism, how important it is to be baptized. And he says, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you do have to be baptized to be a Christian. And right there I went, whoa, <laughs> you do not even know what your own theology is. Don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you do have to be baptized to be a be, to be a faithful Christian. They're trying so hard to bend over backwards not to baptize people; they just can't stand it. Well, Jesus put it in there. We're going to make disciples. How are we going to do that? Baptizing them is going to be a part of that process. Okay, so yeah, this is way long. <laughs> okay, generic. Where's some generic authority? Go. How go? Can you walk? Can you ride a bicycle? We used to take up money and give it to uh, the people in India so that the preachers in India would have bicycles. Can, uh, um, help me. No, Dean Crutchfield. Dean Crutchfield in India for years and years and years talk about, you know, this much money will buy a bicycle for one of the preachers who can go out and ride from place to place. Well, the bicycles are poor transportation. Does it matter whether we walk or ride? Paul sailed on a ship. Can we sail on a ship? Can we get on an airplane? Can we get on a train? It doesn't matter. The authority is to go. 
The how doesn't matter, okay? Can you see the difference in generic and specific authority? Does go include flying into his room? Say it again. Does going include logging into a Zoom meeting with some people? Yes. There you go. That's I, communication. Could I set up a Zoom meeting with somebody in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and teach them the gospel? In theory, yes. Yeah. Go. Go by means of electronics. Yeah, go. That would not be a, 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 out of place. The, the, the whole thing is when we talk about authority, we got two parts. We got one specific authority and two generic authority when we have generic authority then you can do by whatever means is necessary when we have specific authority then you got to do it by a particular way what's the difference how do we know which is which that's sometimes going to be a challenge let me give you an example so i think you can see the difference in a few minutes whew, this illustration worked a lot better before February or March. It doesn't now. We're going to go in a little bit into the auditorium. And before you go into the auditorium, you're going to go by the little basket and you're going to get your little pre-made communion cups with the little... Styrofoam. We're going to have the emblems of our communion. Now, qualitatively, I have a real problem with our present path uh, because I have an extremely hard time looking at that postage stamp as unleavened bread. Uh, if you let it sit on your tongue for a few seconds, it does puff up a little bit, <laughs> and it's, it's a little easier to, to, to go in that direction. But, you know, th this is not what we want. We're not there. But why don't we have pizza and Dr. Pepper? Because Pepperoni pizza. Specific commandment of what to take, and pizza is not it. If you look up pizza in the food chart, where does it fall? Bread. Mm-hmm bread it's a bread is it yes or no not is pizza a bread or not we can yeah. make pizza on unleavened bread yes we make pizza is a bread it is a bread okay dr pepper is dr pepper a drink yes it is a drink all right so we have a drink can we put it in a cup we can put it in a cup if we have a cup and we have bread take this cup eat this bread you okay with Dr. Pepper and pizza? No. How many say yes? Does it have to be grapes? Nobody's going for yes? Why are we not going for yes? Why can I not make a sale here? Because we have a, it is not just drink something and eat something in remembrance of me. When does this occur? Okay. Matthew 26. Come on, let's go. Matthew 26. Oh no, we're we're before that. Okay. Oh. Verse seventeen. Matthew twenty six, seventeen. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread. What? Of the what? Unleavened. First day of the feast of the unleavened bread. What does that mean, the unleavened bread? Well, for a week surrounding Passover, all the Jews put all of the un all leavening out of their houses. And so they ate unleavened bread for a week. So it went a week long, and so you had a whole week where it was unleavened bread only. In the middle of this is Passover. So what was the what was the bread that they ate at Passover? Unleavened. How do we know? We know this is this is what they did. Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? We're still in verse 17. Okay, down to verse 26. As they were eating, 
Jesus took bread. What kind of bread did Jesus take? Unleavened. unleavened bread. How do you know it was unleavened bread? Because it was at the Passover and it was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread when Jews did not eat anything but unleavened bread. Okay? Now, what else? What, what were they drinking? It's not a, said right here, but it is fruit of the vine. It, it would be what, well, this gets us off into another stretch in the ditch. Was it table wine? Well, not according to our modern definition, but it would have been according to theirs. Yes, this would have been grape product of some sort, alcohol based or not. Maybe yes, maybe no. We can't determine from the words themselves because the Greek word oinos describes grapes hanging on the vine, grapes that have been smashed, and grapes that have allowed to be fermented. All of those words can be grouped under the word oinos from the grape, and so we have to determine from context whether it is alcoholic or non. Now, would it help to understand that typically in the when they drank the quote unquote wine that was done at that time, it was mixed with water regularly, often, always. This was how they drank it. Even the Song of Solomon, when, when uh, Solomon is talking about uh, the, the love making between him and his, his beloved, she, what has she done to prepare? She has bathed and perfumed herself. What else has she done? She has mixed all her wines. All the preparation has been done. It, the, 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 it has been gone from the, the stronger alcoholic uh, brew, which would be safer to keep, to that which they drank, which was mixed with water. Why did Jesus command that the wine that he turned, or the water he turned into wine, that the jars be filled all the way to the top? And draw it out and give it to them. Because typically it would be mixed with water. But Jesus did not have his wine mixed with water. It was as he made it. Now, what he made it, was it fresh grape juice or was it an alcoholic product? You let me know when you solve that problem. Because I don't know. I can't answer that. I have my opinion, but I'm, this is not my place to be providing you opinions. All right, so here we get ready to take the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, what is that going to include? It is going to include unleavened bread for sure and fruit of the vine. Specific or generic? Show me a passage of Scripture that says you must do it like this. You may not use Dr. Pepper and pizza. Show me that verse. He took bread, blessed, and broke it. I can break pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that was during the feast of the unleavened bread. And this was the Passover. And the Passover was specifically unleavened bread. Okay. But does it say you can't use pizza? It tells you what to use. Does it say you can't use pizza? <clears throat> Jesus said, How many times have you heard someone say, the Bible doesn't say not to? Where in the Bible does it say you can't do this? Haven't where, you heard that said? Where in the Bible do the other religions get to do it quarterly or whatever? You don't really expect me to jump onto that right this minute, do you? Tack it. Jesus. Pin it. Whatever you call that. When, when we're... What we do, often we come to, that's our, that's our method, our mentality. You're free to do whatever you want as long as it's not prohibited. That is true if we have generic authority. Go. How can you go? You can go any way you want to. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, now we've got some specific. Can we make disciples by having them jump over a broom, held one foot over the... Uh, above the ground? Jump over this broom and you're saved. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, no, you can't do it that way. Well, why not? Where in the Bible does it say you can't do it that way? It doesn't. What it does tell you is how to make disciples. We have examples of them making disciples. Okay, so we have two different things. And why do we, we have to decide what do we have. Do we have a generic or do we have a specific command here in regard to our authority? 
When Paul says on the first day of the week, is that specific or generic? Specific. Lay by in store. Specific. Is that specific or generic? Specific. Give as you've been prospered. Specific or generic? Specific. And see, we can, we can work through some of those things and decide. Can we swipe our ca credit card? Is that payment? Yeah, it is payment. That is giving as we've been prospered. So when we, when we start looking at these pieces, we have to decide, is there an example that we must follow or not? Now, why don't we have yard sales? Why don't we have a, a car wash out here? Put a big sign out here, Maysville Car Wash. We're raising money for, we don't care. Can we have a car wash out here? No, they won't, but I always wondered why. <laughs> Not Why? Wash, that's not there. how. That's not how we um, give to the church. We're not accepting people and washing their cars, and they pay us five bucks for it. That's not the way that we. Can't wait for it. Yes, we, the church we is not in the fundraising business. Well, wait a minute. What What is Paul doing here? What is First Corinthians one and uh, sixteen one and two? If it's not fundraising. But why couldn't you do it to help support the group that goes to Honduras? It is fundraising. How is it fundraising? Who is it fundraising from? The members. All the Christians. The believers. The Christians. The Christians. This is a methodology for Christians to give to Christians. There is not a single passage of Scripture anywhere that asks non-believers or non-Christians to donate to the cause of God. Nothing. Never, ever. Now, if you want to go out and raise money your personal self and then give that to the church, that's authorized. Barnabas had land, he sold it, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias and Sapphira had land, sold it, gave and laid some of the money at the apostles' feet, said it was all of the money. Peter says, it was yours to start with. It was your land. You decided whether you sell it or not. When you decide to sell it, it was still your land. You still had the money. And you were okay up until the decide up until the time you decided to lie. Is there a pattern anywhere for us to become a merchant group where we seek money from outsiders, non-Christians, to do anything? No. no, there is not. I have a question. Can someone leave the church land in their will? Well, legally, yes, they can. And what would happen to it? The church would either keep the land or sell the land. So isn't that the same thing as having a yard sale? No. Why? It's not. <laughs> For several reasons. Oh. That's first or second? First. Okay. Um, I haven't got to ask my contribution question yet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're going to need to write it. We're only on verse 2. Give them a minute. <laughs> Leave in the treasury. <laughs> okay, ask your contribution question. Okay, so a Church of Christ minister once told me that, you know, we give on the first day of the week. Yes. Okay. Well, what about these people that get paid once a month? And they only give on the Those of you who were here last week answer her. Because we sorry, talked about it for twenty minutes. Up, but why is it okay? <laughs> Why is it okay? It's not the first day. It's the first day of every week, just like we take the Lord's Supper. And as you prosper. Yeah. On the first day of the Whenever week. So why can't you why don't you put that money aside and then you give it every first day of the week? We talked about that last week. Well, and Dad Gum, was it recorded? It's, it's up to tell. Yes, it was. Where is it at? It was. You um, you do. But the answer would be yes, it would be appropriate for you to give. See, I you I don't have to watch that class. All right. <laughs> Clearly there are some questions here. Now, oftentimes what happens when we try to wrap over the conversation, we come up next week and I'll say, okay, let's talk about those questions you had last week and I'll hear crickets, you know, here we go. Okay, I don't remember any of the questions. In that case, I'm just gonna go on. Um, if you have a specific question on this topic, you need to come see me after the bell rings so that we can get it written down if I don't get it written down here now, all right? Uh, your questions are, I'm listening. When Paul came and they didn't take collections, 
Hang on a second. Let me get okay. hers first. All right. How is land for sale not a car wash? <laughs> not a car wash. Okay. Why is that, it okay? That'll get us there. Why is it okay to play the stock market, but you can't go to a casino? Janya, that's not even on the top. <laughs> that's the money. It's all the same. <clears throat> okay. Other contribution questions that we have oh, left hanging. Yeah. About Go ahead. Him collecting no collections when I come. So if he was there for two weeks, they didn't let him collect that Sunday. He stayed there a month, that whole month I didn't have to give. Okay, here's the question you want to ask is what about after? After what? After he came and did, did the collection. Did they keep giving money? Yeah, I'll be there too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, we'll, we'll spend a little more time talking about this. We need to talk about the pattern concept of giving. What about after... Does the Baptist question qualify? What? When other churches give and don't, you know, like do the Lord's Supper and all that. It's got to be Southern Baptist. Anybody, I just said, but you know, they do it quarterly or they do it. Oh, right. <clears throat> where does that, where they get their authorization for that? Or their for, for the Lord's Supper? And all of that. Contributors. Contribution. First day of the week. Well, the contribution comes from 1 Corinthians 16. The the other stuff just comes they, out of their head. Do they take a collection every week? I don't know. Yes. They don't say it. Yes, yes. they do. I'll bet they do. <laughs> they don't do the Lord's Supper every week, but I guarantee you they take a collection. How do they not tie all that together? <laughs> well, <laughs> they buy the place from the same people that everybody else does. Not only do they, do they take it up every Sunday, they take it up twice. Yeah, and I have been to church with friends when I was little where they got an envelope in Sunday school. But, but I'm saying. I heard of a group that took the collection and went out and counted it. And uh, whoever was the leader of the group decided there wasn't enough and told them to send the baskets around again. They weren't leaving yet because they weren't done giving. That's truth. Thank you for your time. If you have something you want to include next week, make sure I get it down before you leave.